This is IAQ Radio, indoor air quality radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your host, Radio Joe Hughes, and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotny. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. All right, good day, and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus. This week is episode number 510, and we welcome Whitney Wiseman. He's with the National Organization of Restoration and Remediation Professionals, also a restoration contractor down in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. Before we get started, let's thank our marquee sponsors. IAQ Radio Platinum sponsor is John Don Products, where restoration and abatement contractors shop. Visit them at johndon.com. That's J-O-N-D-O-N.com. Gold sponsors are Particles Plus Engineers and Manufacturers of feature-rich particle counters and air quality monitoring instrumentation. Learn more at ParticlesPlus.com. Count on us. Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions available at HealthyIndoors.com. And AEML Laboratories, free FedEx shipping, great pricing, same-day results, and never a rush fee. Learn more at AEMLinc.com. Association sponsors are the Indoor Air Quality Association, a multidisciplinary organization dedicated to promoting the exchange of indoor environmental information through education and research. Learn more at IAQA.org and RIA, the Restoration Industry Association, the granddaddy of the restoration industry, network with leaders. Learn more at restorationindustry.org. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio trivia question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnik at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z Man with this week's IAQ Radio trivia question. Hello, everyone. Congratulations go out to Nate Burden, Fidelity Inspection Consulting in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, for being first to identify William Ruckel's house, the EPA administrator who later went on to become director of the FBI. The IQ Radio Trivia Question for today, Friday, July 13, 2018, has been sponsored by Ideas, the solution chemistry company, creating unique solutions to odor removal, surface cleaning, and decontamination problems. Here's today's trivia question. According to tradition, what are the names of the three magi, or wise men, who visited Jesus? Back to you, Joe. Good one, Cliff. All right. This week, we've got Whitney Weissman. Whitney started in the industry back in 2004 as a laborer for his family's restoration company. Uh, He was able to grow the company into a a large national company. Uh, He started his own company in 2008 in Miami. While he was uh, also, he went to Florida International University for construction management. And uh, later on, he, a year later, he moved the company to Palm Beach. He's been traveling all over the country, actually, and perform, you know, responding to flooding and hurricanes all around the country. Uh, but the reason we've got him here today is more for his passion for the restoration and remediation industry, and that compelled him to start the nonprofit organization NORP, N-O-R-R-P, or the National Organization of Restoration and Remediation Professionals in 2017. His goal is to provide support to the industry as he has personally faced the challenges that professionals encounter on a daily basis. And we brought him in today to talk a little bit about NORP. Uh, Whitney, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate you guys uh, bringing me on. Great to have you on board. I, you know, let's start out with uh, a little bit on your background. You started out with the family business. Um, is the family business still around or are you... Um, it's actually wasn't the family business. It was a good, good friend, one of my best friends in college, uh, one of those stories, if you will. Um, uh, one of my best friends in college, uh, we were up in it, uh, Orlando, as I mentioned to you. Uh, the hurricanes hit up in, Orla- <clears throat> in Orlando, and his, uh, his brother owned a company at the time, a smaller company, and needed some hands. So um, myself and another individual that we were all close, close friends uh, jumped in the truck and uh, lent a hand. And uh, 14 years later, here we are. Um, you know, it, 
And uh, about three years after working with him, uh, traveling all over the country, which I owe a lot of my education as well as my abilities to do what I do based off of what he put me in, the, you know, in front of me. Um, so, you know, kudos to them and what they're doing. They're still around today. Uh, that was Global Disaster Recovery uh, is the name of that company. Okay. Um, in 2008, I started uh, Restore Force, and from then on, it, we have been a family-owned and operated company since then. Your Restore Force, and that was, I, I misread it. It was a family restoration, not your family restoration. <laughs> All right. My family was, so, uh, you you spent some time, too, on, in the construction, um, uh, what is it, construction management program at Florida International University. I'm just curious about that program. What what exactly, do they have anything on restoration in there? Is it more construction, general construction, contracting? It's all infrastructure, uh, large construction projects, uh, large industrial projects, building airports, designing city infrastructures, roadways, uh, all that kind of stuff. So you learn a lot of the detailed construction elements that you would need to do if you were essentially helping to develop a, a large subdivision or even a small city. All right, one more before we get into NORP. Um, I, I was kind of interested in the fact that you've been to like Cedar Rapids, Atlanta, Chicago, Orlando, Houston twice, Galveston, New York City, New Jersey. So you've been responding around around the country. Um, what would be the biggest, I guess, the biggest lesson learned that you'd like to pass along to other restoration contractors that might be interested in doing the same kind of thing, you know, responding when these hurricanes and big flooding events occur. If I guess the biggest piece of advice I would ever give is that if anybody's ever considering doing it, the times have changed drastically from when we originally started traveling. Um, we had a small carnival of individuals who would, or would just essentially uh, travel around city to city, like a circus, if you would. Um, now it's gotten into a much larger uh, industry of its own. So, Nowadays, being that there are so many people in the industry, I would just say to make sure that you have jobs lined up, have all your I's dotted and your T's crossed, make sure you have everything prepared before you even leave. And the biggest thing, the number one thing is, is if your home base is not equipped for you to leave, don't leave. I don't care how, how potential profits could be there. You can't risk it for that. It just can't do it. It'll ruin you for years and years to come. Great, great points. Uh, very similar to what we've heard from many other guys that go out to the big jobs, you know, and, and, and go around the country. Very, very interesting. All right, Cliff, let me, let me turn it over to you for a minute. Right. So what, what, I mean, there've been regional trade associations, there've been national trade associations, there've been internet groups and, and so on and so forth. What was missing from these groups that caused you to put together this, this concept of NORP? Originally, I thought a lot of things were missing. Um, and then after doing my research, I came to find out that essentially that there's a lot of miseducation and lack of education in who is responsible for what and what their real goals are and their motives are within the industry. Um, a lot of people put a lot more pressure on certain organizations and industry associations than they should essentially assuming that they have roles and obligations that aren't essentially within their purview um, that I personally didn't know about either. Uh, but a lot of it was based off of stresses traveling around the country. You meet a lot of different restoration contractors in all different sets of life and all different areas of the country. Um, and the sentiment is the same. Everybody's dealing with a lot of the same issues. They are different in their own right, but at the same time, the contractor is fighting both a uh, stigma of a bad reputation of restorers in general, as well as um, fighting the fact that we're going against insurance carriers when we should be working with insurance carriers in order to make sure that our clients are brought back to a pre-loss condition. Um, at this point, it's everyone's adapted and tried to overcome, if you will. Um, and it's led us to where we are today, which is essentially an area with a lack of accountability and uh, mindset that everyone's out to get somebody else and everyone's pointing their fingers in the opposite direction. So did, did you try working with any of the existing organizations? Um, is that something that you, you looked at and decided it wasn't worth the time? Let's just go ahead and start this other one. 
I think that all these other organizations, I, not all of, but I want to say organizations and associations such as the RIA and the IICRC definitely have a place in, the, in our industry. And there's nowhere that I think that they need to go um, for initial training and uh, an essential training that goes into the basics. The IICRC is critical for entry level individuals. Um, just to give them something. I mean, it's the only standard we have. So we have to, you know, we have to ride on something. It's, it's all we have at this point until somebody else comes up with something, then it gets approved. And that's not what we're trying to do. Essentially that education is there. Um, so there are good instructors and there are bad instructors. Um, it's figuring out how to make sure that our restorers that are looking to educate themselves go in front of the better instructors so that when they spend the money, take the time, they're leaving with an education that is better than they would get maybe somewhere else. So helping guide them through these things. We're looking to work with these organizations and we've already had discussions with the IICRC. Uh, we have reached out to the RIA as well and had uh, numerous conversations with them and some of the uh, educational boards because we wanna make the RIA's education more accessible to restorers so that more have an opportunity to get these credentials. Uh, being a triple master, uh, well, wrapping up my triple masters with an OSHA class here in the next couple of weeks, um, all I'm missing is that. The next thing for me is CR and WLS. So for me, I can't break away and go to all the conventions and conferences and take these classes on different bases to make so many trips. I'm very busy, unfortunately. So I haven't had the opportunity to, whereas the schedule has allowed for me to do these things. And I know that there's a lot of people that are in a similar situation. So we're not against any of these organizations. We really want to see them get to where they need to be and help give them the support. There's a lot of goals that are and a lot of needed things within the industry and for one organization to be able to accomplish them all themselves, I don't think it's feasible. So in order to do so, we need to make sure that those who are best capable of doing certain things uh, should be allowed to focus on those items while those who may be passionate about other items can focus on those other items and while we're all getting it done as an industry as a whole. You know, one, one of the things that, that, that you said about the, the IICRC, you know, it's unfortunate that you have this standardized curriculum and it really depends on the instructor as to, um, you know, what you're going to learn and, and what you're not going to learn. And I've been thinking really about it a lot. And, and what I've come up with is in many ways, it's, it's what I've begun to call artificial intelligence. You know, people go to this class and they come out and they think that they know stuff. And what they've done is they've gone to a class and learned what to think. They've not learned how to think. And I think that's one of the big differences with the RIA training is that, you know, going through that and even having done some of that uh, was more important on teaching someone not what to think, but teaching someone, you know, how to think and, you know, you know, from, you know, when you go, all these disasters are different and, you know, the challenges are there and, and, you know, the IICRC likes to have like little boxes and, you know, everything's kind of in a row and, you know, so, but. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I, I truly think that, and that's what we hope to do. You know, I hope to make it so that people can transition between the IICRC training. And this is not just me, you know, me and a couple other people who have talked about this within the board, we'd really like to see this happen is, take the standardized IICRC training, add on hands-on concepts, whether it be through seminars or whatever just needs to be available somehow by bringing together guys like Chuck DeWald or Jeremy Reitz to make sure that the individuals who can teach these classes properly do. Um, and then also working with individual groups like the RIA to make sure that as soon as people are ready to transition from, okay, we got the basics of the science, we've been introduced to it, now time to go here so that we can learn how to master and understand the sciences and how to apply them to our trade while at the same time being, you know, brought into the hands-on elements that are missing from both. If, you know, and I do think that both are missing some hands-on elements, which maybe we can help build some curriculum or help to promote some curriculum that may already exist by instructors that are out there that are, you know, doing the right stuff and teaching the right science. But what we do here is a science. It really is. Um, and to try to walk away from it or look that one class said three days or this is that, you know, there's so many different contexts that things can be taken in. Um, but to make an access point to whereas people can go from A to Z and get through it, I think that that's what's needed personally. Um, and I don't think that that's available. 
Well, I, I guess I'm a little confused because in my experience, I, I just want to clarify, the IICRC courses are not standardized enough. The test is, and the test questions are required to be covered by every instructor, but every instructor kind of puts their own thing together around those test questions. Is that accurate? I would think so. From my understanding, and I think you're spot on, um, the test that everyone provides their students has to cover the range of what needs to be approved by the, uh, the IICRC or the class has to cover a certain set of topics in order to meet the test. Um, but every instructor teaches it differently, which is why we think it's so important to shine light on those instructors who are going the extra the mile. I mean, individuals like, you know, not to give light to people, uh, you know, Rachel Adams, perfect example. I've taken her classes and you take a mold class from her or an ASD class. It's not the standardized class. She will go into the details of what needs to happen and she's doing it on a hands-on level and she takes that extra extent. So individuals like that need to be given the spotlight so that people know where their classes are, know how to take their classes, so on and so forth. And there's a lot of instructors that are similar to her. Mickey Lee, perfect example. People need to take Mickey Lee's commercial drying class, hands down. Um, I think everybody should take it. Well, let's, let's get back to that in a minute. But first, John, put up the website, if you would, for NORP, uh, N-O-R-R-P. All right. So, um, the mission statement. Let's go over what the whole idea of the organization is here, Whitney. Uh, the National Organization of uh, Restoration and Remediation Professionals is dedicated to elevating the restoration contractor through unity of purpose, professional and ethical expectations, higher education, uniting against third-party entities, and establishing relationships and partnering with other professional groups essential to building our organization. That's a mouthful. Um, can you can you simplify that for me a little bit? And I got one area there I'd like to ask you about. Definitely. There are many areas of the industry in which we deal with issues on a daily basis. Um, it's not to sit here and say that we alone are going to fix all these specific areas, but I think that we have the resources as well as the relationships with those who can at least start making a huge difference in these areas. Um, we truly think higher education is, is huge. Um, the big thing we've been trying to push lately is, and the, I guess this puts it under the, uh, the mission statement is, are you a restorer? Um, you can be a contractor, you can be a carpet cleaner, you can be whatever it is, a janitorial company. Are you a restorer? If you're doing restoration services, and I would like to say that I wish everybody in the industry would, was a true restorer, but in our eyes, a restorer is somebody who kind of looks, um, at the next level of the industry and how we can better ourselves to build a better name for ourselves because myself as a professional on a day to day fight the, the image that's been built in my area specifically of, Oh, you guys are all just thieves and con men just out here to take advantage of our insurance policies. Um, when in fact that's not the case at all. And it really stinks that this is the sentiment that homeowners have. So in order to fix these things, a lot of these topics that we've laid out within our mission statement, which the mission statement specifically is just uniting and elevating restoration professionals. Um, okay. that is, but we're doing that through these different means. Now, let me, let me, let's get a couple other quick background things done. It's, uh, I, I assume you're a nonprofit group. Yes, sir. You've got uh, how many members now of the, of the organization? We're just under a hundred. Uh, paid members, and we have 2,860 uh, active members on our Facebook uh, group. That's something I want to come back to in a minute, too, because that's very, very interesting. And I, I think I noticed it was like $50 a month for a membership, but 500 a year if you paid all at once? Correct. Okay. Um, now, two two things I wanted, wanted to go back to. One was back on that um, – John, give me that statement again, if you would. It says – Uniting against third-party entities, that one really kind of, I would imagine you get a little grief over that from time to time. Uh, can yeah, you tell us a little bit about what, the, what that's all about? Um, the third-party entity is not, I mean, I guess it's getting a relation to a TPA or a third-party administrator, but that's not what it's really focusing on. Um, uh, third-party okay, but in our opinion, are individuals who are not essentially related or directly related to our industry who are trying to take advantage of or 
play a part in our industry where they have no place. Um, I personally think that TPAs, if done right, like Crawford, um, are good for whether it be a startup company or a company that may not be marketing heavy. Um, it might be good for a different kind of company. We're here to support everybody regardless of what their structure is, regardless of their contract type. We just want to help to make sure that they have the support that they need in order to navigate through the unknown force that you can call our industry. Can you give an example of a third party that's like not supposed to be there? Cause I'm still a little bit confused. Uh, individuals. How can I say this politely? Um, you, don't have to, you don't have to be polite. You can tell I call them snake oil salesman. Uh, okay. Okay. Call it somebody who built a program that had no, that, you know, seems to be okay. You pay a bunch of money or a CRM. CRM is a perfect example of it. Um, these individuals who are spending tons and tons of money on creating programs that restoration contractors are spending lots of money in some cases monthly on that are providing subpar services that don't actually relate to the professional side of what we do. They have some correlations that match and it's the best we have at this point. Um, but these third parties that are essentially not restoration contractors, they're not uh, insurance carriers. They're not insurance adjusters. Um, whatever you want to call it. The CRM stand like, for something. What's, yeah, that? what's a CRM? Uh, the, it's like the management programs that you would use to help run the back of your house and, uh, like the, yeah. your crews going out and then your crews have an app on their phone that they're you know doing stuff with. And then they send it back and so it's um, soft, the software or something. Yeah, so there's a couple companies that are ran by individuals who have been in our industry and truly know what we as professionals need. So that's a service that has value add. But there are also individuals who look at it as uh, just a truly profit-making uh, ability. Uh, another perfect example in Florida, we have lawyers that specifically build their firms off of representing contractors with an assignment of benefits. They're not necessarily looking, I'm not saying all of them, certain individuals that have a bad reputation, I'm not going to name any names, are pushing improper practices and use of the assignment of benefits in order to essentially just rack up court cases. Um, and for me, that is a huge negative for restoration contractors that are not educated in the proper processes that they, they need to use for a proper use of an assignment of benefits when it's needed. And they're just given a thumb drive and said, here, stick this on your contract, give me a call if they don't wanna pay you. And then at the end of the day, you're a contractor with a horrible reputation because you're going after every one of your customers. So there's a balance with the assignment of benefits and there's an education portion that needs to go into it. But at the same time, these outside influences, perfect example, third parties, lawyers are just trying to make a buck. Um, and me, I don't appreciate that. There are good lawyers that look out for you in good ways. I just think that people need to know how to vet these people. Um, and we need to protect our individual restorers against these individuals. So what, what is the issue that, that really kind of brings your group members together? Is there one or is there a, a bunch of them? I know you've kind of told us how you, you know, what, what, we went over the mission statement and I like the simplified version there, uniting and elevating restoration professionals. Would it be the, the elevation of restoration professionals, the unification? What's the biggest driving, you know, uh, issue that brings your members together? Exactly. It's the unification of our industry so that we can take responsibility and accountability for the items that we need to in order to better push and represent ourselves as a specialty trade that we are. Um, I consider ourselves, granted, we're not doctors, but I consider ourselves that we should be looked at in the same light. We're here to arrive in an emergency situation and respond to your property and make sure that we bring it back to a pre-loss condition, which is the same idea as I'm bringing you my child and he's sick. Please get him better as fast as possible. Um, we have the same jobs, just different, you know, different means and different, which we're working on. We're working on properties. They're working on uh, houses. We need to be looked at as that type of a professional. We don't need to be looked at as the guy that's just coming to suck out water from my property or the guy that has these silver pieces of equipment that's just going to do that. Um, and in order to do that, we need to educate homeowners. We need to educate insurance carriers as well as agents on, you know, maybe how to sell larger policy wider policies at higher premiums 
so that when we respond as contractors, we show up and the actual customer has coverage for the work that we need to do. That might reduce the amount of arguing that we do with the actual adjusters. It might make our process and our jobs a lot easier. So there's a lot of things that we can do that may even benefit others like the insurance carriers that could actually help in the long term benefiting us tenfold. I mean, if I know that if I had a customer who, and I show up to their house and they have a good policy and good coverage, that they're going to be able to make sure that our services are covered through their policy. If they have a really horrible policy, I know it's going to be a fight to get every dollar. Sometimes we're not going to, and we're going to have to get beat up by the carrier, so on and so forth. Hmm. If they're sold and informed on a policy in which they actually were given information on what they bought, same as you would if you were buying health insurance, which everybody who buys health insurance because it's so expensive knows exactly what they're paying for. They know what their out of pocket is. They know all these different questions. You, most people at least. So bringing the same responsibility to homeowners insurance is important. And there's a lot of these different things that we face through these things. And essentially it's education on so many different levels, educating homeowners, educating restorers, and bring us to a level where we are looked at as the professionals that we are because we're specialists. This is a specialty trade. I mean, you hire people and pay them to weld underwater pipelines. They get paid a lot of money and they get looked at as specialists in their trade and they're respected and they're revered. I think that we need to get to a point in our industry where we're treated and looked at the same way. That's interesting. And, you know, I used to think that getting uh, consumers to better understand this was kind of a, an impossible, uh, you know, an impossible goal. But I, I, I'm starting to think that might not be the case anymore, especially with social media and you younger folk using that social media to get the word. I, I still am amazed every time one of you guys, we had the Restoration Rebels on, we got you on, you've got 23, 2,500 people on your Facebook uh, page that are, you know, discussing ideas, going back and forth. How many of them are, are consumers or, or is that not a group that you want to be on that particular page? This group is not for consumers. I'm sure that there is one or two, but the, I would say 98 to 99% of our, um, our group is specifically restoration contractors. Of the 2,800 members that I looked at this morning, we have 2,400 that are active. So, that's on a weekly basis. These are people who are, whether they're looking at posts, liking posts, commenting on posts, so on and so forth. Um, they're very active. I, I don't have access to other groups insights, so I can't tell you, you know, how that would compare to others. Um, but the one thing that I know, and a lot of people will reach out to me and tell me is the quality of content within the group is what most people are so happy with, as well as the fact that they know that they can come here and have a safe place. I mean, I've literally burned my relationship with somebody who I revere in the industry and I think is one of the biggest names in the industry, um, specifically because of the fact that there was no respect being given to some of those that were just looking to better themselves. Um, and I'm willing to do that time and time again because I truly think that respect and passing on information and knowledge in a constructive manner is the only way that we're going to better ourselves and get re restoration contractors doing thing on a, doing things on a consistent manner. Cliff, before we go to halftime, do you have another question? Um, no, I'd, I'd like to just go back and, and just uh, focus a little bit more on on the form stuff. You know, one of the things you know, I, I, we talked before about group think and you know, all these people have been trained the same. All these people, you have this. It, it seems that someone will ask a question and the majority of the answers are not original thought. The majority of the answers are right out of the standard, right out of the IICRC playbook. And what happens is, is I think in many cases, there's an easier, better way to do something. And these people won't even try it. They won't even consider it because I don't think they know who the authorities are. I think that's a, that's a scary thing. And I'm going to ask you a personal question. I want you to answer it. This is not a job interview, okay? I'm 68 years old. How old are you? 34 or 33, sorry. Okay, so I have kids your age. Okay, no problem. You're like my in between my, my, my two kids. So I think a lot of times it's this whole mindset 
you know, and I, and I think for your age, you're somewhat unusual into, you know, the fact that, um, you know, you're thinking about other people, you're, you're kind of looking at the big picture and so on and so forth. And, uh, I don't see a sense of entitlement, so it's good. Okay. Having a legacy. I think that's all, all good stuff before, before we break for halftime. Um, I guess the other issue, you know, I still want to get it back to this whole thing, the driving issues, you know, what are the, the big issues? And I think elevating people and elevating, it's obvious you want to see more respect paid to the people who do this type of work. And I, I think Cliff and I agree with you wholeheartedly on that. We, we feel like um, sometimes, you know, people are looked down upon because they're, they're working with their hands. They work out in the field and, um, but I don't think people realize that along with that, you're also doing a lot of thinking on your feet. You're also making very important decisions. What other issue or issues do you see as, as big issues in the restoration industry that we really need to address and that your group is trying to address? You mentioned education. The education, touching on the education one last time, it's not just accessibility to the proper teachers and the proper education. I think that there, and this is one thing that I think is a huge sentiment within a large majority of the group is there is not enough access to truly hands-on training that is applicable to the elements that we see on a day-to-day when we're actually approaching the job sites. Um, we feel regardless if we're sending technicians to training classes, I don't, I don't, it's not to sit here and say that it's the IICRC or point fingers by any means at any of them. Um, it's simply to say that there are very limited training facilities at this point in time that offer a true hands-on approach. Um, and if I could say that we had one big goal, it would be to create a trade school that worked across party lines with the RIA and the IICRC and Chuck DeWald and all these other people who are essentially the scientists within our industry, if you will, um, and create a curriculum that we can use as a trade school so that when people graduate, they're ready to go in the field and actually use the science and apply it to what it is that they're dealing with on a day-to-day basis. And obviously, as I can attest to, it doesn't matter where you go, it's always going to be a little different. Even if you're in the same place, there's always a different variable. So there's nothing that a facility can really do to train you for every variable, but to get you to train and think on your feet and to get you to look at things from a perspective of a restorer versus I'm here to just get a certification. Um, I think that's what will in time separate us. Um, just like how do welders, how do you know if you have a good welder? I mean, I go back to that or a doctor or a dentist, they all go through their processes and get accredited through their schooling. Um, there is no true accredited schooling for our industry. It's probably one of the only trades within the country where there is not a actual trade school. Um, back to why we formed, there was no at this point and there is no until we came around organization that specifically represented restoration and remediation contractors, such as you would have with uh, plumbing uh, associations and roofing associations and all the other HVAC. I mean, you name it, every other sub trade, whether it be general contracting to every sub trade below it has an association that represents its members. We have educational facilities. We have associations that look out for certain things, but as we've mentioned, money is the driving factor for most of those individuals versus progress. Um, and unfortunately, that's just where we live. I mean, that's that's just the nature of the beast. Well, I think you you bring up something that I probably should have clarified with you earlier on. Um, the members of the, the National Organization of Restoration and Remediation Professionals, it's limited to restoration and remediation people. So in other words, uh, let's talk about maybe carpet cleaners, which is a closely you know, a lot of carpet cleaners also do water damage, but if someone's just doing carpet cleaning, does that mean that they're, this, this group is not the best fit for them? If the carpet cleaner is not looking to get into restoration at any point, the carpet cleaner is not looking to know what the restoration contractor he works with is doing or have an understanding of the industry. If he basically wants to have a focus specifically on cleaning carpets, cleaning tile, cleaning hard surfaces, I would probably say that there's a very limited amount of resources that we would have available for them. 
Um, but at the same time, if they ever did want to expand their business and I call it inner diversification, uh, if they wanted to diversify within their own selves, um, then they could definitely utilize us as a resource to make sure that they have a lot less speed bumps to face, you know, when they do make the decision to become a restoration contractor or start doing that type of work. So essentially you're looking at water damage restoration people, fire restoration, mold remediation. Um, what about Crime like asbestos abatement? Go ahead, sit. Crime scene cleanup uh, individuals, that's new to the industry, uh, hazmat, bio. Um, some of the guys, one of the smaller sectors that's obviously growing is the um, what, the meth lab cleanup stuff. So all that stuff that's within it, um, I don't, really think that crossing over into the asbestos side is something that we want to do because I believe that there are enough regulations and other, that's not really, that's its own world in my opinion. Um, okay. say that people won't cross over and do it, but to say that uh, it's one of our focuses is probably not because it's very regulated, which is good. Um, but at the same time, I don't think we have that many issues in that industry. Okay. And Cliff, you had a text question. Yeah, I did. Uh, someone texted in, uh, have you ever considered spending NORP dues to build the organization's own school rather than, you know, suggesting that someone else do it? Using NORPs? I'm sorry, one more time? Okay, uh, I got a text question, uh, you know, from a listener. Have you ever considered using NORPs dues money to build the organization's own school rather than suggesting that others do it? I would say that a portion of the money that came in could be associated to the educational facility, but I would hope that at that point in time, we could have partners such as the IICRC and the RIA who would want to get just as involved as we would want to in order to make sure that a trade school, wherever it may be, was able to be associated. Um, and obviously we would create a board by all these different organizations. So however you want to put it, if everyone's buying in, uh, but we would definitely want to have some sort of a, not stake in it for uh, monetary purposes of profit, uh, but we would want to definitely make sure that we could try to do that if we were able to build a large enough group of individuals and the funds would allow. But um, with a hundred, with other, with under a hundred members at 500 apiece, it's, Understood. it's not quite in our realm of what we can see yet. Understood. What, before we break, all have credit cards, right? Yeah. <laughs> Before we break for halftime, and we're a little over, but that's okay. Um, how many people are on your board? Uh, right now, there are, I mean, it's myself, Luke Spence, Dick Wagner, Scott Tarpley, Bill Genone, so five of us. Five of you. And do you have elections yet, or is that still, I mean, you're, you're fairly new. We so. bylaws, um, and we will, it's, uh, we will be adding probably a couple more positions to the board. I believe we are going to do uh, – 10 or 11 total seats and it's based off of the specific committees and uh, that we're trying to do. Um, all the seats will be able to be moved around if people aren't doing their job. Um, but the main focus is, is ensuring that whoever is involved with the board is focused on what their focus is specifically within the or associate or the organization itself, as well as not promoting themselves. So um, we have discussed future votes but at that point we we haven't gotten to that i mean we're only a year so we're pretty new as far sure. as voting goes. no that's and understandable okay time, so. what we're gonna do we're gonna, we're gonna stop and thank our sponsors and then we'll be back uh with the second half actually a little less than half of, the, of our interview with uh whitney weissman been, been very interesting so far whitney we'll be right back with the president of norp IAQ Radio Platinum sponsor is John Don Products, where restoration and abatement contractors shop. Visit them at johndon.com. That's J-O-N-D-O-N.com. Gold sponsors are Particles Plus engineers and manufacturers of feature-rich particle counters and air quality monitoring instrumentation. Learn more at ParticlesPlus.com. Count on us. Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions available at HealthyIndoors.com. 
and AEML Laboratories. Free FedEx shipping, great pricing, same day results, and never a rush fee. Learn more at AEMLinc.com. Association sponsors are the Indoor Air Quality Association, a multidisciplinary organization dedicated to promoting the exchange of indoor environmental information through education and research. Learn more at IAQA.org and RIA, the Restoration Industry Association, the granddaddy of the restoration industry. Network with leaders. Learn more at RestorationIndustry.org. All right, we're back for the second half of our interview. We've got uh, Whitney Wiseman. We, we, you're the, is it the president? Is that the proper title? I think uh, technically the executive director is the title. Executive director. I think okay. we're going to have a president role for possibly a uh, paid position eventually in the future. Gotcha. Uh, the North National Organization of Restoration and Remediation Professionals. I want to throw out a, a curveball at you here, Whitney. Um, you may or may not be aware, um, the IICRC is, has a, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say owned, but it, it's got a shareholder. There are shareholders. There are like 16 or 18 shareholders. There are regional associations. There are three, I think, individuals, and um, they all have a piece of the pie, basically. They're a shareholder in the IICRC. Cliff and I have been helping out one of these groups for a long time, Triska, the Tri-State Restorers and Specialty Cleaners Association. Uh, they now go by ieqpros.org. But anyway, I'm wondering, if, if you, a lot of these regional organizations are struggling. It's, it's a very difficult thing to do in this day and age. You've got a couple down in your area. Have you, are you, first of all, aware of these regional organizations? And secondly, have you reached out to any of them? Because it seems like you guys are doing pretty well. Maybe that would be uh, an idea to, you know, to, to, you know, blend in with one of these regionals or have them blend in with you. Any thoughts on that? Oh, definitely. We've uh, had many talks. I mean, to when it comes to the actual um, stakeholder for the IICRC, um, not to jinx anything, but we have started the application process for that. We had to meet a minimum of 50 members in order to start that process. So um, when we were in Atlanta, we were able to speak with a lot of the powers that be with the IICRC and uh, really get a feel of things. And it seems like we will be a really great working relationship with those guys. Um, so we're really excited about what could potentially come from that, but obviously um, that would all have to be approved. So I don't want to put the uh, buggy before the horse on that one. Um, then when it comes to the other regional groups, we've actually been approached by two of the different regional groups, which we are looking to team up with in certain ways to make sure that we can have a, we've talked to the idea of reciprocal uh, memberships, the talk of uh, how we can somehow make it so that the members of one becomes a member of the the other um, and gets access to the benefits of each other. Cause it, this is not about one organization taking over. This is about, uh, I guess the best way that I've described it to others is kind of like NATO for our industry. Um, we have a lot of good people trying to do good things. We just have to basically come all together at the same table, get organized and get our all heads on the same place. Um, so we want to work with everybody who is trying to make change within the industry. And there are organizations and sub chapters that, you know, focus on cleaners as well as restoration contractors. So we'd be interested mm -hmm. in them as well because just because they work with cleaners and restoration contractors we want to work with them on everything because the more we can educate everybody i think that that's better the carpet cleaners know what to do or know why they shouldn't do it if it's something like that or may think a little bit harder about getting into the industry because of the true nuances that we face um there's a lot of different things that can be offered to people i just think that coming together and having a uh, united mentality, if you will, and really looking at ourselves as professionals, like every other professional does, uh, every other industry, at least. Um, why should we not? It's kind of where we're at. I've got a text question here. And then, and, and it's, I think it's a really good one. It's something that I thought about while you were discussing um, identifying good or bad instructors. And, and I'm wondering how you do that. And, um, well, you've got to be really careful on that, I would imagine, because that, that can really get, uh, get sticky. Very sticky. You gotta, if you remove yourself from 
all right, we don't take payoffs from anybody. So that's, that's easy. So we don't have any instructors that are paying us to be on our list or we don't really even have a list per se. Um, I look at individuals that have, that we look at it as a, what can be offered to the individual going to the class? Do they constantly hold their classes without canceling? So do they schedule a class and then cancel it? Because that's a huge issue. A lot of people will have these things and then they'll schedule a class. It gets canceled and now they can't take it for another year. Is so that a big issue in the industry? I didn't, I didn't realize that. Yeah, consistently following through with the scheduled classes in which they hold. So if you schedule one, you're, you're holding it. Four okay. people, whatever. Um, we want to make sure that the people or the instructors, regardless of instructor, that the class is being held at a facility that is able to at least handle the minimum amount of hands-on stuff that is necessary for them to teach what they need to teach. We're looking for individuals who teach not outside of the curriculum, but who teach the curriculum, but also the added value add on services that I think a, a working contractor needs to approach or at least keep in mind when they are approaching a job site. So um, individuals who have had multiple years of experience in the industry, uh, those individuals or instructors who are currently actually performing restoration work on a daily basis and just go teach classes on the side, like myself, I teach for the state licensing in Florida or used to. I work every day as a remediation contractor and then I leave for three days and I'll go teach the hands-on portion and the mold aspect for a, a former association before we started ours. Um, hmm. It's the hands-on knowledge that we deal with on a day-to-day -day allows us to teach these things better. And I think betting the individuals based off of a lot of these different uh, ideals uh, will really enable us to have a list of those who are better. And then we use peer review. Um, you have 2,800 people who've all been to classes. It's pretty easy to get a response on who's good and who's not good. Um, you know, people are brutally honest. Well, it sounds like it's a little more informal as opposed to a formal list that you have posted or something like that. Is that accurate to say? I think it's safe to say that that's probably the most politically correct way for us to do it um, is to make sure that we give light to those people uh, who we think are promoting proper education in the industry and those who are trying to do so elsewhere, uh, we really don't promote it. But it works out on its own. I think, I think it's self-generating. Most people who leave a good class go on a NORP and talk about where they just were that week and how amazing that experience was, so on and so forth. A lot of people from then start asking about these instructors. I didn't know who Rachel Adams was, no offense, before taking one of her classes. I'm on social media. She's an all-star. She's a superstar in our world. You know, everybody knows who she is. So these platforms really enable those who are educated to get the light that they need because people are constantly calling them out for advice and asking them for, you know, opinions on things because they know that they can trust them. Let me ask you another quick, uh, I want to go back to a statement I think you made earlier that RIA courses, um, how, in your opinion, I know they're, they're a sponsor and I know they would love to know um, why do you feel they're hard to access? I'm not sure of any of the actual structure on how they schedule or organize what classes happen at what point in time. I know that there are prerequisites for each of the main designations, and then there is an individual class as well as a paper that needs to be put together for your CR and WLS at least. Um, those are the two that okay. I'm focused on. So from that point, normally – the only classes that they have take place on or before one of their conventions or conferences that they okay. hold. Um, so where, it's not, it's the amount, the number of them. They really don't have that many every year, I would imagine. Yeah, exactly. So what we're trying to do is we have two classrooms in our area that we want to allow RIA to set up, whether it be five or seven day classes to whereas you can handle the prerequisites as well as the main class that happens, whether it be for WLS in one setup and CR in another, we want to allow them to utilize our facility so that everyone in South Florida has access to these things. We have another classroom in Indiana, um, in Kokomo, where we are going to have access to that. Also, I've talked to other facilities that teach um, that would be more than happy to have these classes and we'd be more than happy to work with the RIA to both schedule and promote these classes because we truly feel that the RIA's education is so essential in our industry, but yet so limited as far as accessibility um, when it comes to the common restorer. So 
if we can help to tip the seesaw, if you will, and play our part in making sure that these classes are more accessible by all means. And I implore anybody with the RIA who is interested in following up with this to give me a call and reach out. And we would be more than happy to stick any of these classes onto the schedule and get them promoted immediately. I mean, this is something we've been working on um, for a while. It's just been a little tough. Fair enough. All right, Cliff, any, any more questions from you? I do. Uh, looking back over the year, what is the um, what is the thing that you're most proud of? You know, the, the biggest accomplishment, or you know, what gives you the, the greatest amount of pride? I think it's silly, and we keep going back to the free group. Um, but being the shepherd, if you will, and the giver that I am, um, I get the greatest sense of accomplishment by seeing so many people come together in one place and discuss common themed elements and do it with such a respectful tone. Um, I've been a part of a lot of groups and I actually recently dropped out of all of them because of the fact that I don't really feel that there's the sense of respect that we have here. And for me, it's amazing to see how many people have been able to grow their businesses based off of just networking and peer, uh, peer help, you know, help from their peers. That, to me, that, that's a win. I look at that as a win. There's no monetary gain. I don't, I'm not looking at money. So for us, it's not about money. Um, I could truly care less about a lot of the things that most organizations care about. I really just want to see our industry get to a point where we're just strong. We love each other. I mean, we're a big family of people who truly care as far as restorers go. Um, and I want to make sure that, that that's successful for people. So really it. What about a big... Big, hairy, audacious goal. What's what's your big, hairy, audacious goal? for? I mean, if you could just wave the magic wand and have something happen, what would it be? I think the biggest audacious – there's two of them. And one of them is the trade school, um, creating the trade school so that we can have a truly systemized process for people to actually get access to training. That's huge for me. Um, and secondarily, it's – somehow uh, bridging the gap between homeowners or property owners, insurance carriers, and our industry itself so that we can have a flow of our jobs that more commonly would relate to a general contractor building a house. Um, I would like people to know what they're expecting and knowing what they're getting. If a they know what a dehumidifier is and an air mover is and know that you shouldn't have 10 dehus in one room and you shouldn't have 50 fans that are air movers in one room. You know, there's some common things that you can teach people that let them know they're getting taken advantage of. Um, and if customers can call contractors out, then that'll make contractors be better contractors. If we can work with the carriers, it's that three-way circle, if you will. Um, we're the experts in our industry and I don't think that we need to replace ourselves with some sort of a designation by any means. Um, but at the same time, I think that we need to hold ourselves accountable. And if there was one big dream that I could have, and I could have my Martin Luther King moment, it would be like, I have a dream, it would be that restoration contractors would hold themselves accountable and truly, truly represent themselves as if they were holding them, as if they had agreed to, like at doctors, if we took an oath and we actually cared about it, I, I wish we could get to a point where people cared that much. Who knows if it'll happen? That's my dream. <laughs> uh, you know, I think there's a lot of restoration contractors that feel the same way. I, I suspect it's a fairly small percentage of them that gives the whole group a bad name, unfortunately. But I, I could be wrong. I don't know. Cliff, what do you think? I don't know, Joe. I don't know. You know, <laughs> I... I, I uh... You know, he has this dream for a trade school. I, I know someone else who had the same dream, and I know someone else who had one, and I know someone else who tried to donate it and yeah. uh, got turned yeah. down by a couple of groups. So, yeah. in any event, uh, you know, good luck. And uh, it's going to be a tough road. Over. And like I said, these are the things. Um, like you said, there there are aha moments. If we could reach them, then great. But. I do know in the time being, regardless of achieving those goals or not, certain things like working with the IIC or the RIA to make their education more accessible to restorers, that's a huge, that would be a huge win for us. Uh, making sure that the 
uh, IICRC, getting involved with the IICRC and becoming one of their stakeholders, that would be a huge win for us. Um, a lot of the things that we're working on, uh, we're not big talkers about things we want to do. Uh, we want to try to achieve some things and then start talking about them when we're about 90% through the way of actually achieving them. Um, that way, we're not those guys just throwing out a whole bunch of goals into the air and not achieving anything, and then we disappear in a couple of years. Um, we want to, I mean, for instance, nobody knew that we were working with the state of Florida for the to become an educational provider. Not something we're promoting, but it's a it's an achievement. Once we do that, we can work with New York, Washington D.C., Louisiana, Texas, and we can work with all those other places and actually have a part in. It's not just teaching the classes; it's having a part in their licensing law. By being a contributor, you're able to have access to it. So it's the things you have to do in order to sit at the table. You know, I noticed you had a, um, I can't remember the proper term, but like a mini conference uh, in April. And I'm wondering what any future plans are for either local or, uh, you know, mini conferences or larger conferences. What's, what's the game plan for that? Yeah, we'll probably do a uh, annual conference here after the hurricane season. Um, we haven't announced the date yet. Uh, hurricane season is not the time to schedule any events from what we learned long, long ago. Yep. Um, so we're probably most likely going to be sometime after the new year, um, wintertime, maybe make a little uh, Florida retreat and get away for everybody to come down to Florida and get away from the cold. A uh, place to come together and do that. Um, we don't have any dates and we don't have any plans as of yet, but we have been discussing it as the last event was definitely a success. So we'll probably do something similar, maybe a little bit larger so that we can have our board meeting uh, as part of it as well. Okay. That was the next question. Do, do you have a, where do you have your uh, board meetings and do you have like an annual meeting for, uh, so that members can come and talk to the board or like, I guess you, with the, uh, with the Facebook group, you get, you get a lot of interaction between your members and your board. Oh yeah. We get lots of action interaction through the Facebook group. Um, having the closed Facebook group for our paid members allows for them to have uh, uh, a more direct communication line to the board members, if you will. Um, but then our board meetings do uh, normally take place month to month. Uh, the last couple months, everyone's been a little bit busy. So we've actually fallen through on the last month and a half. So we've missed two meetings, but, um, they weren't really scheduled. So as far as, you know, keeping them going, uh, the next meeting, we're going to start doing them on zoom. Uh, we're going to make our meetings, uh, essentially accessible for our members. Um, paid members will be able to watch our meetings. Um, and then all the meetings will be posted onto our website in the member section. So the members can go back and watch those meetings and see what we talked about. Um, and then we're going to be using the Facebook closed group as our forum for our members, just cause it's very well put together as far as functionality goes. Um, and it's just going to be a link directly from our website. So it'll go right into it. Everyone will, if you're a member, you're a member, we add people into it. So it's really easy. Um, and then people can discuss the topics that they may have seen on some of the old board meetings and you can get really open. I got to tell you, I love the idea of having your board meetings open to the membership and, and have them accessible to the membership. I tried to get IAQA to do that years ago and they, kind of went in the opposite direction and then we had a lot of problems because of that a lot of bad decisions because of that um, not really letting the members know what the heck was going on and uh, you know we ended up with uh, an executive director spending time in jail over it you know because the members weren't watching over what was going on with the organization so I, I hope you're successful with that maybe I'm wrong maybe it's not a good idea but I sure hope you're successful with that Cliff any final thoughts before we uh let Whitney wrap it up with the, the usual last question. No, no, I think that uh, you know it's it's good to see someone his age, uh, you know, engaged and uh, involved. That's good. Trying and and learning. Um, Whitney, prior to leaving, we always ask: Is there anything you'd like to add? Anything we missed? Um, any final thoughts for listeners? Yeah, if, I would just implore anybody who has an interest in what we are trying to do. Um, to check out our website at the least. Um, if you feel that you are interested in becoming a member, please feel free to join. Uh, we welcome you. And anybody who's just interested in seeing what we're all about, the free Facebook page is obviously available to everybody. Uh, if you're a contractor, go on there and join. We have a couple of questions that just tell us who you are and whether you're a contractor or a 
uh, insurance person or whatever the case may be. Most people are contractors and we welcome everybody. Uh, it's a safe place. And I just wanted to say thank you to both of you gentlemen for uh, having me on here today. It's been an honor and uh, I've been a huge fan of the radio show for a few years now and following you guys behind the scenes quietly for, for quite some time. So it's, it's, it's an honor to be here and I truly do uh, thank you for having me. Well, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. It's been a very interesting interview. I always enjoy uh, talking to the, the next generation coming up, taking over, and uh, I think we're going to be in pretty good shape here at Cliff. But anyway, this is Radio Joe Hughes saying thanks to this week's guest, Whitney Weissman. We, we really appreciate it. The National Organization of Restoration and Remediation Professionals, NORP. Uh, of course, thanks to my co-host, the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. Cliff, what, what's going on next week? Do we have that nailed down? Are we going to have the, the global I, watchdog? I thought, is that the uh, Australia one? Yeah, yeah, that's right. We've got the Australia one next week. So we're going to do a little, uh, little international flavor show next week, a little roundup of what occurred at the, the event over in Australia, the RIA, hopefully our – Global Watchdog will be joining us as well. I um, also want to thank at the controls, John, you got to have faith. Most importantly, our growing group of loyal listeners. Hey, check out the, the YouTube videos. They're, they're all up now. And uh, YouTube, uh, we're starting to get some people re- going to the YouTube site. Of course, you can also get the podcasts from Podbean. And uh, we realize now that a lot of people who had subscribed through iTunes are not getting the, the downloads since we switched over from TalkShoe. We are aware of that. We're working on that. Um, you can always just go back and sign up for iTunes again, but uh, we're going to try and get them all transferred over if uh, we can get some cooperation from TalkShoe. So we'll be back next Friday at noon with the next edition of IAQ Radio. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening.